Hello and welcome to this, the sixth session of the RQI uh, online 2020-2021. Thank you very much for coming. It's good to see you again. Uh, this morning, we're going to begin the session with our invited speaker, Professor Rob Mann from the University of Waterloo. Uh, so, uh, Rob, uh, whenever you want to share your screen, you can start the presentation. Okay. Um... There we go. Can everybody see that? Perfect. So Rob, uh, you have uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, if uh, you need, I'll give you a five minute warning, but if you need to, as useful, you come back into the question time. Okay, thank you. So uh, thanks and uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon or good evening, depending on whatever time zone you're in. That's one of the nice things about an online conference, I think. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is talking about uh, some work that I've done with some of my uh, former and uh, one present student, uh, Laura Henderson, Roby Hennigar, and uh, Alexander Smith are all now PH former PhD students. Uh, Johnny Zhang uh, was a visitor uh, at the time from uh, China, and Matthew Robbins will uh, soon be a former PhD student. He'll be defending later this year. And it concerns something that has already been uh, a theme of the conference, uh, but in a rather different way. And as you can see from the title, we've called it the anti-hawking effect. And it really has to do with how uh, detectors actually provide us with information about quantum fields and in this case, uh, near a black hole. But let me continue. Uh, the quantum vacuum is an essential concept in relativistic quantum information. And it's quite a noisy thing. It has lots of fluctuations in it and lots of correlations in it. And without them, we would not be seeing any, uh, many of the effects uh, that we have discussed in this meeting. So a key question is, how do we probe the quantum vacuum? And the obvious answer is with quantum probes that I will refer to as detectors. And these refer to local measurements made by particle detector models. And they provide us with information um, about the vacuum and about the state of a quantum field in general. Uh, without, we can calculate everything we like about a quantum field, but without the ability to uh, couple it to detecting type objects, our calculations will uh, never go beyond theoretical concept, I would suggest. So this is connected with something we've heard uh, several times already at this online meeting, operationalism. And simply put, time is what clocks measure, length is what rulers determine, particles are what particle detectors detect. We've heard that already a few times in this meeting. And temperature is what a thermometer records. And one does need to be aware in all of these things of circular reasoning, which I, I'm not going to go into the philosophy of, but I will, uh, the point I'm trying to make by all of this sort of thing is that in many of the things we do, we presume we have measuring instruments that, uh, <clears throat> that will tell us things about these quantities and here the concern is with uh, what the measuring instruments can tell us particularly about the last item, temperature. So quantum detectors are model systems that couple to quantum fields and they can be qubits or harmonic oscillators or Gaussian systems. And they provide this operational way to uh, learn, empirically learn about temperature, entropy, correlations, uh, mutual information, entanglement, uh, the information paradox, and so on. Uh, the the uh, one over on the right is a harmonic oscillator, and there has been some work done on this, and one can discern 
relevant physical quantities from a covariance matrix. But in this uh, presentation, I'm going to be concentrating on what is uh, very commonly used in the discipline here, which is the Unruh DeWitt detector, the UDW detector, or a qubit detector, which is simply a system that has a ground state and an excited state that I symbolize with this box here. Um, a quantum dot could be an actual physical realization of such a thing. It is described by uh, most simply by an action that is given in terms of uh, the qubit Q and the field phi and an interaction between them. And that interaction can either be like this, it's typically a linear interaction where the detector moving on a world line interacts with the field. Uh, and so we have this delta function uh, that it of course only senses the field when, uh, for the parts of the field that are on the world line. Uh, or we could put it in a cavity, in which case the field modes become discretized and we end up with a Hamiltonian here. And here I've got all of the things labeled for you so that you uh, don't use track. And there was a rather uh, thorough discu uh, discussion given a number of years ago in both of these papers about how this is set up and, and uh, how it works. <clears throat> So A dagger A uh, with a sub D refers to the detector mode, and it has only two levels, grounded, excited, whereas the field modes uh, in a cavity are discrete and can be added up. And if the detector is moving, then the relationship between the proper time of the detector and the time of the field, if you like, will have this dt d tau factor, and we have the interaction governed by S. And so what one does in this is we typically couple field to detector with um, a switching function that is, uh, I'll, I think in this talk, use Gaussian, uh, a Gaussian switcher, but it doesn't have to be such a thing. The second term in this interaction Hamiltonian is called the monopole operator. And it uh, simply changes ground to excited or excited to ground with these appropriate uh, frequency factors. And then what one does is evolve uh, the density matrix using uh, this time ordered operator here uh, to obtain the um, density matrix uh, from some initial state which we take to be the vacuum in the case of interest here. And we sum over all of the field modes. And this gives us the reduced uh, density matrix, in this case, for a pair of detectors, if we had uh, more than one of them. Here, I'm summing over however many detectors we've got. In the case of a single detector, we get this rather simple density matrix to order lambda squared in the coupling constant between field and uh, detector. And this is uh, the piece of D quantity here. This quantity is uh, called the transition function and is related to the probability the detector gets excited from the ground state. The quantity W is the uh, Whiteman function of the field, basically the vacuum two-point correlator. Um, tau will be related to T by some kind of uh, gamma factor, relativistic gamma factor, depending on the situation in the detector. And now um, I want to get to the point of thermometry. If we have a thermal field state, then the Whiteman function will obey this relationship. If we uh, take it, uh, this is a function of tau and tau prime. So if we shift tau by an imaginary factor divided by the KMS temperature, we will get the same thing if it is in a thermal field state. And that's a 
Uh, that's the Kubel Martin Schwinger condition, and it's a general condition for a thermal state of a quantum field. And we can calculate, as I said, P sub D is the response. So it's normal in this discipline to uh, mod out the width of the detector if it's a Gaussian and lambda squared and compute this quantity F. And so another quantity of interest related to temperature is something we called uh, the EDR uh, ratio, the excited detector uh, ratio. And if the detector is thermalized, then the ratio of F at omega to F at negative omega will be given by this exponential factor, which is e to the minus omega, omega is the energy gap of the detector, divided by a quantity that we would interpret as the temperature. And we would call that the EDR temperature. Uh, or if you like the detector temperature given by this quantity here. So we know what the gap is because we've built the detector and R is something that one uh, can calculate. And so we can determine the temperature based on the excitation ratio, which could be determined in principle in experiment. And if the detector is a good thermometer, presumably there will be a relationship between the EDR temperature and the KMS temperature. Uh, and that in fact is what was discovered some 45 years ago now uh, for uniformly accelerating detectors. As I think everybody listening into this meeting knows, we have uh, an inertial detector in Minkowski space will basically never see the ground state of the uh, its ground state become excited. But what was shown uh, by uh, Davies, Unruh, and Fulling some in the mid 1970s was that an ex a uniformly accelerated detector will in fact uh, become thermally excited, and there will be. Uh, a whole range of excited states of the field that will in turn excite the detector. Uh, this factor cosh R is related to the gap of the detector divided by its acceleration parameter A uh, given in this quantity here in Rindler space. And so um, the KMS temperature turns out to be the EDR temperature, which turns out to be A over 2 pi, apart from factors of Boltzmann's constant and Planck's constant and the speed of light. So I think this is familiar to everyone. And, and it stood uh, in the field for some three decades until about uh, 15 years or so ago, when people began to explore in a bit more detail uh, what this means when we lose the idealizations of uniform acceleration. And I don't have time to go through that all, uh, all of that history. Uh, but what I do want to do is focus on something that Wilson Brenna and Eduardo Martin Martinez and Eric Brown and I did about, oh boy, this is eight years ago now, where we considered a detector in a cavity. And the question was, uh, how can we look more realistically at acceleration radiation or, or the Unruh effect. No detector accelerates for all eternity uniformly. ID, more in, in a more realistic situation, we would put it in a cavity and see if we could accelerate it somehow and then see what happened to all its states as it went through the cavity. And uh, this has been looked at in, in, in this paper here and a number of papers here I've listed at the, the side. Uh, one can do this to a certain extent non-perturbatively and you can smooth out um, nasty switching effects and avoid a causal signaling. Uh, the question we were interested in or questions is will, will the detector thermalize and is the temperature Propor indeed proportional to the acceleration inside the cavity. And how sensitive is this to boundary conditions? So this is what we looked at in this paper up here. And what we found was the following graph, uh, the green crosses, which are very difficult to see maybe, they're down here at the bottom, are correspond to periodic boundary conditions in the cavity. The X is Neumann and the square is Dirichlet. And uh, 
we found numerically that indeed the temperature was proportional to the acceleration of the detector uh, measured in some standard units here. And that was fine, but the slope was not given by the two pi when we took one over two pi, sorry, that we took into account in with these normalized units. Uh, the, the boundary conditions all matched up for high acceleration, but not for low acceleration. So those were the two features we found. And one might think, well, that's pretty good, right? What really matters is that temperature is proportional to acceleration. And we thought so too, but we were curious about what was going on down here uh, at smaller accelerations. So uh, we ramped up the code and we discovered what we decided to call the anti-Unruh effect. That when we went to quite small accelerations on the same scale, we found that the uh, F function or the uh, P function, as I put in a few slides ago for detector excitation, would uh, decline um, depending on the gap. So if the gap was large, it grew with acceleration as expected. But if the gap were not large, then it would fall. And the, the scales here are different because the gap is different. The blue corresponds to the blue dash. The red corresponds to the uh, red solid. Um, and this was for a switching width of 0.4 and a cavity length of 200. Um, so for large omega, the excitation increased with A, but for small omega, it decreased with A. And we found this very puzzling and checked our calculations a number of times, but could not find anything wrong with it. Uh, when we went public with it, we were accused of this being a transient effect. I'll mention something about that in a minute. But what's most striking is that this is going backwards. It's, instead of temperature going up as acceleration goes up, it went down, and hence the name, uh, anti unruh effect. And we plotted this then over a much broader range of switching widths and detector accelerations and found the following graph, namely for a large region of parameter space up here, the rate of change of temperature with acceleration was positive, and that's given by this color-coded diagram here, where zero is right on this dashed line. So the Unruh effect is the uh, red, yellow uh, type of uh, structures up here, whereas the anti-Unruh effect, we're now below zero, the slope of the curve is negative. And this persuaded us that this uh, was not a, a transient effect. So uh, uh, Jose Ramon and Luis Garay and Eduardo took a look at this in more detail in this paper here. Um, and they, in this paper, found or, that there were actually two kinds of anti-Unruh effects, a weak one and a strong one. The weak one is given by this derivative condition. And what it basically means is that the detector clicks less often as the temperature goes up. And they found that this could persist for arbitrarily long interaction times. The other was a strong effect, which is where the rate of change of the EDR temperature with respect to the KMS temperature was negative. And, and this happened for thermalized detectors. And what it means is that the recorded temperature as given by what your device tells you, goes down as the KMS field temperature goes up. It's as though your radio station says, hey, we're going to go up to a high of 13 Celsius today. And as you wait through the day, your thermometer goes down as you feel it get hotter, maybe. So your body thermometer is reading the right temperature, but your physical thermometer may not be. So, so that's what this kind of thing means. So what, what uh, uh, Laura, uh, Roby, Alex, uh, Johnny, and I did in this paper was take a look at this kind of effect in anti desitter space. We came to it because we were interested in studying uh, uh, entanglement, detector entanglement outside black holes. And we came across this phenomenon in the course of so doing. 
and it turned into what I'm presenting now. So in anti de space, you can consider a uniformly accelerating detector, and it's possible to map ADS to a, uh, a finite sized region by a conformal map. And that's what I've done here, symbolized by this MC Esther painting, where time is moving vertically and there's a conformal boundary here. And <clears throat> just as you can for flat space, you can put you, you can uh, develop Rindler type coordinates in ADS, and this is what they uh, look like. And Jennings discovered, uh, Jennings was the first to look at this actually about 11 years ago in the CQG paper, and he found that the accelerating detector in uniformly accelerating detector in ADS would get hot, but only above a certain threshold acceleration namely that the acceleration uh, parameter times the ADS length had to be larger than one. And if it were not, the detector would not get excited. So we took uh, a look at this uh, response function in more detail, <coughs> being aware of the anti-UNRU effect. And uh, here is standard ADS for those of you that are familiar with it. And, the ADS Rindler coordinate transformation puts it in this form, which is the metric for a uniformly accelerated observer in ADS. Uh, y goes from plus to minus infinity. It's not periodic. At a constant value of x, which is analogous to where the Rindler observer would be in flat space, the acceleration works out to be this quantity here, where little x is given by the location of the coordinate location of the detector divided by the ADS length. And the regularity of the Euclidean sector, uh, if you uh, carry out the standard Euclidianization arguments for the Whiteman function, uh, tells you that beta in these coordinates is 2 pi L, or the KMS temperature is given by this quantity here, which when you insert these factors above looks like, like this. So that would be the KMS temperature as sensed by the uh, uh, detector when you look at it in terms of the uh, constant X location. So we computed the response function with Gaussian switching, which turns out to be given by this uh, expression right here in terms of this pair of integrals. Zeta is a quantity that is uh, dependent on boundary conditions at zero for transparent and it's plus or minus one for Dirichlet Neumann. And in the infinite uh, interaction time limit, you can show that this quantity reduces to this structure right here, where you can see we're getting a familiar type of uh, unru type of expression here uh, multiplied by this quantity on the right that depends on this boundary condition parameter zeta. And the point is you can plot this and you see that there is in ADS space uh, and a weak anti-UNRU effect uh, for the Neumann boundary conditions. This is a plot of the response uh, in the limit of infinite switching with, so the detector is effectively always on, analogous to the uh, original UNRU effect. And this is the KMS temperature times L, a unitless measure of it. And for the Dirichlet and transparent conditions, we see that F always increases as temperature goes up. The detector is clicking more as the field gets hotter, but not so for Neumann, which at first increases, but has this region here where it declines. And so we found there is a weak anti-UNRU effect at ADS. Maybe that's not too surprising, given that there is one in flat space. But then what we did is go from ADS Rindler to the BTZ black hole, which is very easily done in these coordinates. You let X be R over the square root of M, and Y be M times phi, where phi is periodic from 0 to 2 pi. And this turns out to be the BTZ black hole, Banyados title Boehm's and Ellie black hole. And it's Penrose diagram is given by this structure here. And so now a static detector 
well, well, the analog of the, the Rindler observer is this static detector outside of the black hole. And the Whiteman function, the reason why this is such a nice space time to work with is the Whiteman function for BTZ is given by this image sum over the ADS Whiteman function, where gamma is the periodic identification given by changing Y into phi. And you keep periodically identifying and adding up over all of them. The temperature of the BTZ black hole is well known. It's the square root of the dimensionless mass parameter over twice pi ADS length. At constant R, you have a redshift in the temperature. And so the KMS temperature at some given value of R sub D, this should be an R sub D down here, uh, you get this expression right here. And this led us to what we call the anti-Hawking effect, uh, which as you probably expect would mean that as the black hole gets hotter, your thermometer says it's getting colder. The weak anti-Hawking effect is one we found for all three boundary conditions. And uh, to remind you, this means that the detector is clicking less often as the black hole temperature rises. And here is a graph that shows it. And here you might think, well, are, is the Dirichlet doing it? The answer is yes, only a little bit as the inset shows. But nevertheless, it is there. Um, so we do indeed see this, uh, and that's what we reported in this paper. I would emphasize this happens only for small mass black holes. If the black hole mass is large, even uh, I think 10 times larger, this effect washes out. It only, it only occurs for small mass black holes. It does occur over a range of gap. Uh, this is for a gap of one tenth, but th th it's not only for that gap. Oh, five minutes more. Sure. Uh, we also found a strong anti-Hawking effect, which was the, the uh, this ratio was negative again for all three boundary conditions and again for tiny masses, that the EDR temperature, the detector determined temperature uh, as plotted against the KMS temperature is not uniformly increasing. It actually decreases if the mass of the black hole is small enough. So here are the two effects. Uh, we found that the weak and strong effects, anti-Hawking effects, were present for all boundary conditions and for small masses. At large mass, I haven't plotted it here, but you get the expected behavior. Uh, and we found that the temperature was gap dependent uh, we did find the detailed balance condition was satisfied over a range of parameters considered. It's why we think it's not a transient effect. So I want to spend my last few minutes talking about work that is new with Matthew Robbins on the rotating case. Uh, here, the metric becomes more complicated for a rotating BTZ black hole. I've written it down here. We have now a shift function as well as a lapse function. But if you take detectors to be co-rotating with the angular velocity of the black hole, you find that the response rate has the thermal KMS property as shown in this paper by Yormaluko and Lee Hodgkinson. And in a paper that uh, Matthew, Laura and I put out a couple of months ago, that entanglement harvesting, the ability to extract entanglement from the vacuum is significantly amplified for black holes that are near externality, and that's a whole other talk in itself. What I want to point out here is work in progress that says, we what, what does rotation do to the weak anti-Hawking effect? Well, it's still a small mass effect. We find that as you get near externality, so no rotation is the blue curve, 50% uh, of externality is orange, and then uh, J over ML is 0.9, and here it's 99%. Uh, J over ML equals one is an extremal black hole. So what we find is that rotation enhances the weak anti-Hawking effect, but it seems to diminish the strong anti-Hawking effect. And we're quite puzzled about this. The no rotation curve you can see is this top one. And as um, uh, 
rotation increases toward extremality, this minimum gets further and further over here. And the range at which the usual behavior occurs increases. We do not have a good explanation at this point in time for why that is. If the boundary condition is Dirichlet, then the effect is pretty much entirely washed out as you get near extremality, not so much so for transparent conditions. Here's an inset of what's going on in this more interesting region right here. No rotation at the top, near extremality at the bottom. Uh, so we found that it, we were finding, this is still work in progress, that rotation diminishes the effect. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Uh, we find that both weak and strong anti-Hawking effects are present for the BTZ black hole. Uh, the weak effect means that the detector clicks less often as the KMS temperature goes up, and the strong effect that is that the EDR temperature goes down as the KMS temperature goes up. These are small mass effects. You won't see them for large mass black holes. We have checked. Uh, we find that rotation seems to have contrary effects. It enhances the weak, but diminishes the strong. Uh, it's a bit biblical in some sense, I guess. And, and finally, future directions uh, of this work. Well, I think a lot more study needs to be made. It would be nice to know how peculiar these effects are for the BTZ black hole. So it's definitely worth looking at higher dimensional ones. Uh, we are carrying out a study of uh, detectors that are falling toward the horizon. Uh, there's already one paper out and one plus one. And um, uh, uh, there are a number of us, Yorma, Kifeng, uh, uh, Chen Zhang and I working on another and Ken uh, Yoshimura and Erickson Joe and I have the one plus one paper out. Uh, with cosmological horizons, do these effect happens? I think there's a lot of scope for study here. And ultimately, what makes this happen? How, under what circumstances can we trust the thermometers that we are using? Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Rob, for a great talk. So we open uh, the floor for questions now. As usual, please use the raise hand feature, um, or uh, alternatively, give it video and signal on Rick. He's going to be paying attention to see it. Okay, there's actually one question from Rick himself. So let's go with that one first, and then we continue. Rob, thank you so much for the, the very clarifying talk about the anti under effect and anti hawking effect. Uh, how small do these masses actually have to be? Like, do you have a, a more concrete example or? Yeah, it have you seemed, plugged in numbers there? It, 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 well, we're still studying this for rotation. Um, one over 100 is enough. Less than one, uh, sorry, bigger than one tenth is basically not. The effect begins to emerge between one over 10 and one over 100. Uh, but again, it's done numerically. We haven't done a huge detailed study of the thresholds. Um, what we wanted to do is point out the effect. And it, it's very clear when we're one over 100. I don't know. I see Laura is on here and Matthew. They might be able to comment on the threshold. Uh, do you either of you have anything to say about that? Uh, yeah, I, I can. Um, it's my video showing up. Just want to make yep. sure I show my yes. face. Uh, I think it's there's a couple of things that are important is one and two plus one. Mass is actually dimensionless. So when we say small, we mean small as an absolute number, not small compared to switching or some other scale. Um, and then the other thing is when you're constructing these black holes through the image sum, it's actually, uh, if you uh, have a, the terms in the image sum die off exponentially in mass. So you need a small mass in order to pick up many of these image sum terms. And it's the image sum terms that just, that um, change what's essentially Rindler ADS into a, a, gen a genuine black hole. So you need mass small enough to make have these image sum terms actually start to matter in the Whiten function. I don't know if that answers the question about uh, threshold or, or mass threshold. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That was very clarifying. Yeah. All right. So the next question in order of appearance uh, already disappeared. <laughs> 
So uh, I'm going to go with uh, the order that we had. So Benito, you're the next one. Hello. Hey. Th thanks for the thanks for the um, talk, Rob. The, the, I actually I learned a lot because I have heard these names before, but never really got a, you know such a clear idea on what they were. Um, nothing against Stephen Hawking or Bill Unruh. I'm just you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, a, a couple of questions. I mean, first, do you think that you know there are some experimental prospects or advantages or ways in which this anti unruh or hawking effects can be exploited or are they really not useful is you know perhaps the the range of, well in particular for anti unruh it seems that you have a kink at lower accelerations well that sounds maybe a bit attractive i mean what do you think well i i guess i mean if we believe our our uh our theories, the answer is yes. Uh, I would say that, like what I would say is that if, if indeed analog systems can see some version of the Unruh effect, as we heard a couple of weeks ago, that looks like it might be possible, um, then this should happen. Now, that's there's a qualifier on that. One would have to see if it actually happened for the system one is looking at, and we don't know that. But it's an obvious research problem to try, and and see uh, does the does circular unru is there a circular anti unru effect? There may not be, in which case that would not be uh, fruitful. Um, but I think the answer is we don't know. Uh, there was at RQI South a uh, discussion of a different kind of experimental UDW detector uh, that Sho Ono talked about, but there isn't a paper out about it yet. So I can't even comment on the details. Uh, he said it'll be out in a couple of months. Um, but it is, it, 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 it's, for lack of a better word, a competitor to what we heard discussed uh, a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago for the analog case. Um, so uh, hope springs eternal. Yeah, I, I mean, in, if it, it, the formalism says this will happen. I think at a more fundamental physics level, maybe even philosophical level, we're told a particle is what a particle detector detects. So what does it mean if the particle detector isn't detecting as much? Does that mean there are fewer particles? Well, operationally, I guess it does. But, but our field temperature is saying there should be more. And I, I think the implications of that for fundamental physics remain to be understood. Yeah, that, that was exactly my second question. I mean, on the operational meaning of detector, but I guess you already kind of... Um, yeah. It, it is tricky, I must say. Yep. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So the next uh, question, Alex Ferreira. Thank you very much. And thank you for the talk, Professor Robert. And uh, I was wondering if you believe that this effect has some correlation with the negative energies that can appear in the Uru effect and near black holes, and also with subvacuum phenomena, because subvacuum pheno phenomena come mainly due to the image charge contribution in the fluctuations? So that those are both very good questions. The answer is possibly, I don't know. Um, when people first uh, observed the Unruh effect, there was this whole study of negative energy flux going in and positive energy going out and so on. Uh, how that applies to the situations where these, we see this, I think that's part of what I mean when I say, what makes this happen? How is this understood? But what, what we do know is that for large enough mass, we, uh, we don't see this effect. Uh, as Laura said, the image terms are in the sum are suppressed for large mass. And so, uh, but but nevertheless, there is hawking radiation. So um, so that negative energy flux is there, and what effect those terms have on the negative energy flux? That's a very good question. I don't know. 
I, I think it's an interesting thing to study. Thanks, uh, because next week I will be presenting and we were able to show that increasing the KMS temperature, you could uh, have more negative energy. So you could decrease the energy of uh, a particle. And I think that's related. To and that's on next question. That's on next week? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. I'll be there. Thanks. Well, I'll be here, but I'll be there. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Alex. Uh, next question is Sandeep Sharma. Uh, hello, Robert. Hi. Thanks for a nice talk. So I have this question. <clears throat> what will be the temperature detected if your the de detector acceleration is non-uniform for a certain period of time? Sorry, I didn't hear all that. Are you asking what happens if the detector acceleration is non-uniform? Yeah, yeah, for a certain uh, period of time. Okay, so, um, well, in part, that is what Wilson, Eduardo, and I studied when we looked at the cavity problem, although we, we arranged so that it was uniform within the cavity, uh, yeah. and, and we saw this effect. But what we're seeing, so what, what it, the last part, the Annie Hawking effect, um, that's for a static detector outside of a black hole, which is the analog of a uniformly accelerated Rindler observer. Um, so the answer is, uh, I don't know, but the fact that we saw it in the cavity suggests that eternal uniform acceleration is not required, but Again, a, a more detailed study would need to be carried out. One uh, kind of study people have done is to use uh, Costa Vialba coordinates, which are coordinates where uh, in the distant past, uh, the observer is inertial, but in the distant future, they're uniformly accelerating. And so you only have one horizon and that's been uh, a kind of toy space time for studying non-uniform acceleration effects. The arithmetic is notably more difficult there. So yeah, I, I mean, I think these things need to be understood as to what happens when we uh, drop it. But the standard um, approach of keeping a detector at a uh, fixed distance from a black hole is giving us these results. I, I mean, partly uh, we're trying to address this when we have infalling detectors. Uh, and there is, as I said, a paper I have out with uh, Ken uh, Gallock, Yoshimura, and Erickson Joa uh, on a one plus one model of infalling detectors through a horizon. Uh, we're looking at their entanglement properties uh, as uh, well, as well as their excitation ones, we're focusing more on entanglement there, but they are definitely not uniformly accelerating. Uh, what happens, mm -hmm. we, we didn't see, but then again, we didn't look for anti unruh effects there. The, the obvious okay. place to do it is in the BTZ black hole because we know easily how to find it now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, I, have a, I have a question or a comment question related to things that have been said. So in the, um, it, was, it was asked before whether, the, at least for the anti andro I, I can definitely comment on it. It was asked before whether the, the anti andro phase a vacuum phenomenon. Uh, in, in that paper that Rob cited um, uh, with Luis Garay and, and uh, uh, Jose de Ramon, we actually show that this will not be present in a thermal state in Minkowski, for example. So the, the, the key point is that the commutator uh, uh, whether the commutator depends on the temperature or not. The expectation of the commutator depends on the temperature or not. And in the Andrew effect, it doesn't. Uh, the, the, it's through the trajectory of the detector, it's through the pullback of the trajectory detector on the commutator, you can have the strong and the weak one. You would not have them in a thermal state if you have an inertial detector in a thermal state in flat space time. In, a game, in those cases, the commutator uh, 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 does depend on the temperature. And, uh, and that is uh, necessary and sufficient for these effects. But I wonder, the question uh, goes here, Rob, uh, how do you check? Because of course, in the, if you have a KM state and you follow uh, the, uh, the, the trajectory associated with that proper time uh, with respect to the field KMS, in the long time limit, you will eventually thermalize. But of course, these effects are finite time, right? So, 
So uh, I wonder, Rob. So have you checked those uh, whether the the, the dependence uh, can because in some cases the dependence will come through the trajectory. In some cases, it would come through the commutator of the field. I mean, I don't know in the case of the VTC black hole how that actually works. We haven't studied that in detail. No, it's a good question. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I, there's another question, but I don't know if it's public or private. So, so I don't know. Uh, Benito, you want to make a public question? Or because it's messaging me. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry. It's just that uh, I thought it. I thought I'd just write it privately to you, but I can make it public, certainly. I didn't understand what you meant by the commutator depending on the temperature. I mean, yes. in general, the commutator. I can clarify. So if you have a thermal state in flat space time, the commutator expectation depends on the, on the, on the, so the opposite, sorry, my bad. So what I mean is that, uh, no, in general, it won't depend on the temperature, right? So the, uh, let me just recall. Uh, right, so the, 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 the commutator is a, it's state it's dependent. Important. I agree. I agree. State dependent. So, the, uh, so yeah. the Weinman function with respect to translation. What I mean is that uh, the Weinman function satisfies KMS commutator on the proper time detector, whose trajectory does not depend. On, I said commutator. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> is okay. the trajectory depend on the temperature or not? So let me let me rectify and correct myself. Uh, okay. The key point is whether the trajectory depends on the temperature or not. Uh, so in the Andrew effect, of course, the trajectory depends on the temperature. It's through the pullback on the Weinmann that you get the temperature dependence. Uh, in the case of a thermal state, the Weinmann depends on the temperature, independently of the trajectory of the detector. Uh, you would have that, uh, in that case, you have uh, the, the trajectory detector being inertial. The temperature is not related to the trajectory of the detector. That's the necessary and sufficient condition for the strong and weak anti Andrew effects. But actually, Eduardo, I'm not sure about the, but the, your statement would have made sense to me if you just earlier on, if you had just replaced commutator by anti-commutator. Yeah, yeah I mean anti-commutator. Is that part of the, but, not the, sta the state dependent part of the Y money. Right. So, so then I think that, yeah, so the statement you made earlier on uh, would have then uh, made sense, just yes. replacing, I think, commutator by anti-commutator. Indeed. Yeah. Sorry about that. It was, uh, <laughs> it was a slight uh, a mistake on my side. But that is certainly the necessary and sufficient condition. And I wonder, uh, Rob, maybe that's something that can be checked as well in the case of the VTC black hole, because I don't know how the, the temperature, you have part of the dependence on the trajectory, right? And part that is not, no? Because some of it is because of the black hole presence on the white manga. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. That's, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Let's thank Rob, Rob again. Thank you. And we have our next speaker. Uh, so, by the way, I'm going to stop the recording now. All right, our next speaker is Dan Grimmer. Uh, Dan Grimmer, former PhD student uh, here at Waterloo, and now a uh, philosopher of physics in Oxford. So Dan is going to tell us about the Andrew effect in slow motion. Dan, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Eduardo, thank you for the introduction. As Eduardo said, this is work I did at the University of Waterloo with Silas Brenn and Eduardo. Uh, we have an archive number here. You can go check that out. Uh, and Eduardo, I already mentioned I'm at Oxford now. Uh, here's my email and my website. Uh, so let's just uh, jump into it. So I'll be telling you about the UNRWA effect in slow motion. So Rob already introduced uh, the UNRWA effect, and I think we all know quite a lot about it. So I, I don't feel the need to introduce it. Um, but why is direct detection hard? What I'm going to be talking about today is a, a sort of setup on which you could build an experimental proposal to measure the under effect. But there's some theoretical interest in this too, in this setup as well. Okay, so issue number one, which is much discussed, is that reasonable under temperatures require huge acceleration. And so for instance, one Kelvin uh, requires 10 to the 19 Gs, which is the strength of gravity on Earth. So that's a very common, a much discussed problem. There's a second issue, which is not so well discussed, is that thermalization is a slow process, slow in quotes. Um, the, the thermalization time for any thermometer has to be much larger than the Heisenberg time of the thermometer. And these towers mean it's the proper time of the thermometer. So this has to be larger than two pi times the gap, or two pi divided by the gap, which is the Heisenberg time. Basically, the thermometer has to take one tour around its Hilbert space, or phase space, before it can have a chance to even thermalize. And so for, for just a generic atomic transition that I take 21 centimeters, this Heisenberg time is four nanoseconds. 
which is fast on human time scales, but compared to this acceleration, it's very slow. So what, what do these two issues imply together? That if we take huge accelerations for these long times, then we get out astronomical distances. If I use the numbers above this acceleration and this time here, you put them together and you get A tau thermal over C is 4,000. Actually, it has to be much larger than 4,000 here. I've just used the Heisenberg time. But anyway, so you get 4,000. 4,000 isn't a large number, but let's look at how it enters the equations. So from the rest frame of the detector to its final frame, once it's done thermalizing, uh, you have to have a, a Lorentz factor between those two frames of e to the 4,000. And this propagates through into the distances and times in the lab frame. The distance is e to the 4,000 millimeter, and the time is e to the 4,000 picoseconds. Even though the, this time is small, for the probe, the proper time is small, the lab time is just absolutely huge if you want to do any direct detection along these lines. So really, we need to make this 4,000 number smaller. And what that means is we need to have A tau thermal over C much or less than or about one. All right, so, so fair enough. Let's take that, let's, let's now consider a different proposal that has A tau thermal over C less than or about one. You can, there's a simple line of inequalities here that shows you why that's an issue as well. So one is larger than about this number, which has to be much larger than the Heisenberg time with the acceleration. But you can rewrite this to be the ratio of the under temperature over the gap. And so you end up with this ratio much, much less than one. So if we go for these uh, small accelerations and small times, then you have to have very few excitations, is what this ends up saying. So it seems like we have a dilemma. Either A tau is much larger than one, and we have astronomical distances and times, or A tau is less than or about one, and we have very few excitations. This is all to sort of motivate our uh, proposal, because we claim to be able to get around this. So is picking one of these unavoidable? Uh, I'm going to claim that it's not, then we have a good way to do that. There are actually two ways around that sort of quick argument that I uh, presented. What we assumed in that is that the probe is always accelerating in the same direction. And that's why we accumulated all this speed and all this distance in the same direction, which ultimately was what caused the, one of the problems. So let's instead have the acceleration change direction. And immediately two ways to do that should come to mind. There's one where you have a circular trajectory, uh, which is discussed in this paper. And I think we have a few of the authors here in the audience, uh, uh, Cisco and Jorma and Silke are here, I think. So we have this circular trajectory where you move up in space time in a helix, or then there's this other one, an alternating linear, where you accelerate and then you suddenly switch to decelerating in the opposite direction and decelerate to a stop and then accelerate and decelerate as well. So these are two options to, to fix this in the same direction problem. The issue with both of these is that they introduce jerks into the detector. And by jerk, I mean third time derivative. So you don't have a constant acceleration. Uh, so we have a constant jerk on the left-hand side and a sudden jerk on the right-hand side. We have sudden jerks at each of these inflection points. Okay, so uh, a good question that might follow from this, and I think this was asked uh, after the last talk, was will the probe still thermalize to a temperature proportional to the acceleration on these jerky trajectories? Right? It's not obvious that it will. Uh, and if so, is the temperature independent of everything else, independent of the probe gap and the orbit speed and the orbit radius? And so this study here that I'm citing down here uh, looked at the circular trajectory case in particular in 2 plus 1 and 3 plus 1d and found out how the probe's final temperature depends on these other parameters that I'm mentioning here. And they, the study indicates that while you do get some proportionality to the acceleration, in general, it's not independent of everything else, which I, I think that's a problem. And to, to answer Rob's question, uh, or to, to restate Rob's question, when can we trust our thermometers? Can we trust thermometers that depend on these other factors? I think there's a very clear reason why we can't. But when is a temperature a temperature? So you may ask, you may be skeptical of what I'm saying and say, but why should we demand P proportional to A and that it's independent of everything else. Isn't it enough to have temperature proportional to A with some proportionality constant? 
And with that proportionality constant, it's roughly constant with say varying by 10 plus or minus 10% over some regime of interest. You might think that that's, that's good enough and that, that these can be goodish thermometers and they can tell us something about what's going on. But I, I, I wanna push back on that and say that it's not enough. And here's, here's the reason, uh, it's very basic thermodynamics to take me to this conclusion is that by the zeroth law of thermodynamics, temperature is a label for equivalence classes of equilibrium systems. And what that means is that if the unread temperature is supposed to be the temperature of something, then any thermometer has to agree on that temperature measurement. Imagine it didn't. Imagine you had something of some temperature and you put one thermometer in contact with it and it says one calorie. And you put another thermometer in contact with it and both these thermometers thermalize with the thing, but this second one reads off 1.1 Kelvin. These are, these are bad thermometers, obviously, but the way to really make that concrete is to put those two thermometers, which are now both thermal with the system being measured, put them in contact with each other and you would find heat flow between them. And so these temperatures can't be working as described. They, they, you, really any temperature which varies from thermometer to thermometer, from thermometer to thermometer is not a temperature, but it's not the temperature of something that you are thermalizing with. All right, so I, I think this is a problem with the circular uh, proposals. And so we have a sort of alternate proposal. What is the source of these sort of not a temperature issues in the circular trajectory setup? In my mind, it is what I just introduced. It's, it's the constant jerks that the probe undergoes. And now those were present in the linear setup as well. But in what I'm claiming is that in the linear case, we can make some adjustments to completely remove these in the alternating linear setup. And in particular, on the left here, I've got a space-bound diagram for, for this modified alternating linear setup that I want to talk about. So we have the red trajectory here is the probe accelerating and decelerating, accelerating and decelerating. And the new addition here are these blue things. These are cavity walls that we're introducing that go up here. And they intersect with the trajectory at each of these uh, acceleration switching points. So by taking Dirichlet boundary conditions at the cavity walls, we can completely remove the effects of the jerks. And I do mean completely. There's no approximation to get rid of them. So each time that the probe has one of these jerks and changes its acceleration suddenly, it's completely decoupled from the field. It may want to absorb extra photons at that time or emit extra photons at that time, but it can't because it's completely decoupled from the field. So hopefully this will... Uh, uh, remove some of those jerk-based effects and we'll find a better better temperature coming out of this thing at the end. But you might be skeptical. This seems like a pretty radical change to the setup, all these cavity walls. What consequences can we expect from this sort of alteration? I'll go through some positive ones first and then, and then the negative ones that you might anticipate. So the first good reason, the pro here, a reason to hope that this is okay, is that we've completely removed the jerks. And so we should get a better temperature response if it does thermalize. Second reason is that the cavity modes are discrete, and so it's easier to calculate with. That's a sort of pragmatic upside. The third reason this might be good is that it, we get at the end of the day discrete Markovian dynamics. We're not making a Markovian assumption. We get out truly discrete Markovian dynamics. And what I mean by that is cell by cell, we have the same update map. So a cell is, uh, I didn't mention, a cell is two cavities side by side. So this is one cell, and then there's a second cell where we accelerate and decelerate. When you, when you cross one of the cells, you just apply some CPTP map to the state to get the next state. Right? And what, the, what causes this is the, those cavity walls shield the probe from the wider environment. So this is, again, a very pragmatic, useful tool, and I'll talk about it more in a second. Uh, the fourth reason this is a good thing, you might think this is a good thing, is that it lets us get around that dilemma that we were talking about earlier. So let, let tau max be the proper time that the probe is in one of the cavities. In principle, we can have this less than the thermalization time, which means that we're not assuming that the probe thermalizes within a single cavity. Instead, what we're thinking is that it interacts with lots of cavities and by this long process comes to thermalize them with them all collectively. And in this case, we can have we can avoid becoming ultra relativistic, which was the initial problem. If, if this gamma max, which is based on the tau max time, 
is much less than gamma thermal, which was e to the 4,000 or something like that, remember, we can, we can avoid having this be very large. And if we can get eight max to be around one, then we can avoid the astronomical distances and things. Okay, so those are some positive aspects of this setup. And they're pragmatic and they help us avoid this dilemma. So fair enough. But again, this seems like a radical change to the setup. What, what negative consequences are there? There are, there are two which, seem, which come out to be relevant. The cavity modes here are discrete. We're not in a continuum. We're not in empty space, right? We've broken the Lorentz symmetry. So the probe might be able to resolve this discreteness of the cavity and spoil the effect. Okay, that's a valid concern. Um, and second, there's a second concern is that cavity walls also trap the probe in with radiation from within the current cavity. In the space-time diagram here, I've drawn these black lines, which is a null particle moving back and forward across the cavity. And you can see if the probe doesn't escape the first cavity quick enough, if it exits somewhere up here at the top half of the diagram, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, it would interact with this same proton many times going back and forward. And any other junk that it emits will also bounce back and forward. Right? So the probe would, in this sense, be seeing its own reflection in the cavity walls, which, which would not be a good thing. But to give a spoiler for the later bit of the talk, luckily there are regimes where both of these cons, as I've mentioned, are avoided. And they're avoided simultaneously. Uh, but, but I'll come to that in a second. To, to give a concrete example of what we might think of when we put this into an experiment is we could either use voltages, which is what I've talked about here in this uh, diagram. So we have the probe traveling through and say it's a charged probe and it accelerates by this voltage and then decelerates and then it accelerates and decelerates. It's being pushed and pulled by the voltages. Or you could also probably do this with laser pulses. We're not really committed to a particular experimental implementation. But one thing which would hold in any implementation is that we can reuse old cavities once they return to their ground state. So once the probe goes through all of these, it'll mess up each field, but if they have some finite quality factor, they'll relax at some rate. And then we can circle back and come back through them again, a second lap around. So we don't need a, a huge number of cavities to do this. Okay, I'd like to tell you the results, but first uh, I sh we should state some details of the setup, we have a one plus one D massless scalar field phi and a harmonic oscillator probe Q with a gap omega. And they couple linearly with the point like steering function in this way, this is all very standard. Coupling strength lambda here, uh, probe operator and the field operator evaluated at the location of the probe. And the dynamics here is given by repeated applications of some map phi cell. I mentioned earlier that this is a very nice thing that comes out of introducing the cavity walls. So we just repeatedly apply this map and it uh, chunk by chunk moves us through the evolution. And there are uh, some other aspects of this which make this a particularly easy type of dynamics to evaluate. So the, our setup is all Gaussian uh, and we have this repeated update map here. And putting those together along with a lot of the work I did in my PhD thesis, we can use this Gaussian interpolated collision model formalism uh, to find out what the fixed point of this map is and what its convergence rate is. And really we have full access to any dynamical question we'd like to ask in this setting. Okay, so let's talk about the results. Now, we have four free parameters in our setup. There's the cavity length, the probe acceleration, the probe frequency, and the coupling strength. We make those all dimensionless with the length a l over c, omega l over c, and lambda l over square root of h bar c. And we fix the coupling strength to be 0 0.01. So what we're doing here is non-perturbative. So what do we find in terms of thermalization? The dynamics uh, has an attractive fixed point, And this attractive fixed point is nearly indistinguishable from thermal for all parameters considered. And I, I can't tell you too many details about that now, but it's all in the paper. But as such, what this means, the fact that the probe does thermalize, we can talk about the probe's temperature T, which we can make dimensionless by multiplying by L. Um, the under effect would have T proportional to A. And so we're gonna look for T zero proportional to A zero. Uh, so DT zero by DA zero equals constant. 
So now it's important to remember that this temperature is the temperature of the probe. It's what Rob would have called the EDR temperature, although we're not exactly using EDR stuff to do this. Um, but this doesn't mean that the, there is something in the environment which also has this temperature. Like I mentioned earlier, to establish there's something in the environment that has this temperature, you need to put it in contact with multiple thermometers and make sure they all have the same reading, exactly the same reading. Okay, so here's the results. Uh, I said we were interested in BTDA, uh, and we find that there is a regime over here where it's constant. On the x-axis, we have the log of the acceleration, and on the y-axis, we have the probe gap, made dimensionless. So there is some region here where we find something like the under effect. And now something I should point out in connection to Roth's talk is that there are regions over here where DTDA is negative. So we get down into this blue region over here. So in this region, we have something like uh, an anti under effect, which is interesting. Okay, uh, so why did we lose this effect? We have it in this region. We have a dashed vertical line here. Left of this, the reason we lose the effect is that the probe sees its own reflection in a sense. Remember I showed the null trajectory bouncing back and forward. Uh, it sees some of those reflections and the under effect is spoiled over there. And above the dashed line, the probe has long enough to realize, hey, I'm in a cavity. I shouldn't be acting like I'm in free space. And the under effect is spoiled up there as well. But in this bottom region over here, there, both effects are avoided and the under effect is not spoiled. So we have in this region T proportional to A, and also it's independent of omega and L and lambda, which as I stressed earlier is very important. So what is the slope in there, that value of DTDA? Uh, here are some horizontal slices from the previous figure. So these are horizontal cuts here at pi over 16 and pi over eight and pi over four. And so the right portion of the next plot corresponds to over here. Um, we see that it is constant over here and independent of the gap. And the value for DTDA over there is one half such that we have a temperature equals to one half H bar A over KBC. So we're just missing a factor of pi, otherwise we would have exactly the under effect in this region. Why are we missing the factor of pi? You can ask me later and I have some things to say about that. So in conclusion, I've cast the difficulty of detecting the uh, under effect as a dilemma. We either need astronomical distances or time scales, or we need very low excitation numbers. This can be avoided by changing the direction of the acceleration in an alternating or linear way. But either way, this introduces jerks, which can muddy or distort the temperature acceleration relationship, especially for the circular setups, as I've argued. But what we've shown is a cavity-based alternating linear setup where the effects of these jerks can be completely removed. And moreover, the, in this regime, the cavity-induced effects are also absent, although they, they do appear where you sort of expect them to. And as a final note, uh, if you plug numbers into this formalism that we've been talking about, uh, the proposal does seem to be experimentally feasible as well. And I've got more slides on that if anybody wants to know. So uh, thank you for your attention. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Dan. Um, all right, other than that, as usual, please uh, raise your hands if you have questions. First question is from Rob. Yeah, thanks, Dan. It's quite interesting. So can you show the slides on feasibility? Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, so we, we see that we can get this to work down to this vertical dashed line here in terms of decreasing the acceleration. So where does that happen? We lose the effect at accelerations of A0 the dimensionless acceleration equals one quarter. That's where we lose it. And so for a tabletop size setup, which is like one meter, it implies 10 to the 15 Gs. And for a LIGO size setup, we can get down to as low as uh, 10 to the 11 Gs. And in either case, the maximum Lorentz factor is only five fourths. So we have, it's not E to the 4,000. No, it's much smaller than that. So that's good. Um, and so what that means in terms of times, is that the accelerations the probe needs to undergo need to be sustained across the cavity 
and the cavity crossing times in the lab time is like 10 nanoseconds or 40 microseconds in the two length scales we're talking about. So these times aren't tremendously long. Um, so we've avoided the astronomical distances and time scales, at least for one cavity. But what if we have to go through a huge number of cavities to get this to work? That obviously wouldn't be good. So we've crunched the numbers, and it turns out that you need something like 70,000 cells for this coupling strength that we talked about here. And, and this n cells number scales with the coupling strength such that if you have a stronger interaction, it thermalizes quicker. Okay, but I said that we can reuse cavities once they relax back to the ground state. So we don't need 7,000 cavities all in a row. We need maybe 1,000 of them and we'll lap around 70 times. Something like that would work. And so how long would it take to cross 70,000 cavities? You take these, these cavity crossing times I mentioned here, and just multiply them by 70,000. And you get that in the lab size, in the table size setup, it's 14 milliseconds to thermalize one throw. And in the LIGO size setup, it's about one minute to thermalize one throw. And so these therm these are the times to thermalize one probe, but then how many probes do we need to thermalize for confidence detection? If we have to do a million of these probes, it's going to take a million minutes, which is quite a long time. So last, last slide on this. Uh, for these two scales that I've been talking about, the final probe temperatures are 300 microkelvin and 71 nanokelvin each. But a more relevant parameter is the expected number of excitations in the probe which remember earlier in our dilemma, I said that this had to be much less than one. And if you pick numbers here, uh, you get that this can be about a half. So we can have about one half of an excitation in each probe that comes out of the system. And so if you're, if you're testing, is it excited at all versus not excited ground state? You only need to see a few of these before you can be pretty well assured that there is something going on where the probe's not in this ground state when it leaves this whole system. Uh, and here are some frequencies that we would need to achieve there. We'd need 60 megahertz for one throw in the one meter setup and 15 kilohertz in the LIGO sized setup. But what it seems like we've done here is we've avoided both of the horns of the dilemma. Uh, we can have non astronomical distances and we can have a reasonable number of excitations in the probe once it's thermalized. Okay, 10 to the 11 is still pretty, that's a lot of G's. Yeah, right. But it, this is 10 to the 11 is much smaller than anything else, realistic. Yeah, yeah, it is. But I mean, one could consider, I mean, what if you put something inside the cavities to make the effective speed of light go down? Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't considered it. Anyway, that's I'll, I'll, others have questions, so. All right. The next question is Cisco. Um, hello. Yeah, that was an interesting talk. Thank you for that. Um, I, have, I have two very quick questions. Um, one is about what exactly you meant. Actually, that slide is on the, I'll ask that question first. Is it exactly flat in that lower right corner region? Because I, I, I noticed like it looks like there's some functional dependence. Um, and the, as you get out of that uh, ideal region, you have some blues and some changing colors. Is it right. identically flat in the bottom corner? Or is, are the other contributions just negligible? Um, they are very small. Um, here, here's, um, here's the slices of this plot. So this figure, cut it horizontally. And you can see DTA, sorry, DT0, DA here. This dashed line is at 1 half. Um, and so it's very close to 1 half for all of that. And it converges. I don't know if we looked at how quickly it converges, but this is this is the log here. So over over several orders of magnitude, it's very very constant. And um, okay. the independence of with the gap here, all these curves are on top of each other. It's sorry, as soon as here, right? So uh, I, I and do they the I, and this was all done. Do they the, converge uh, identically though? Sorry. Do they converge identically uh, given the different parameter like gap and other parameters um, they might They seem to. Yeah. This is all done numerically. Uh, so I can't tell you for certain what's going on, but it seems uh, like I was I was just worried it, I, I was wondering if the, the tiny wiggles 
as they converge all overlap with one another? Oh, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't expect them to align exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. OK, so then my question is kind of this does seem to have some dependence on the parameters. It's just that the dependence is very small. So you have an effective thermometer that's very accurate in that regime, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. that okay. Uh, I, I, was, I was just wondering if your, your previous definition of thermometer was more strict than really makes sense because I don't know a thermometer in the world that is exactly that exactly has that feature and I'm not sure any thermometer in the world could, does satisfy that condition right um, um, anyway this is just oh so yeah yeah that's true I, I think questions I about agree. what exactly we mean by thermometry are very interesting um, because in, in practice of course thermometers only work over certain ranges right and we have to, in order to get down to low temperatures we have a overlapping set of temperature standards in practice which sort of relate to it's like the astronomical distance ladder like it's the same thing for low temperatures we have these cross validating things so actual thermometry is very messy but when we talk about thermodynamics well, well I, should, I should distinguish there's two types of thermometers there's thermometers which measure temperatures by thermalizing with the thing they're trying to measure and then somehow about themselves the temperature is manifestly obvious. And there's other things which have some more complicated functional dependence on the temperature of the thing they're interacting with. And we learn what that function is, measure the output, and then there's some process of evaluation or function inversion to find that, right? So I'm talking about thermometers that actually thermalize with the thing they're trying to measure. And in that case, if you have two thermalizing thermometers which thermalize two different temperatures on the same system, well then like you violate all the laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> After that. Okay. So, okay. So Thank you. Yeah, maybe, it, it is. It's complicated. <laughs> maybe maybe one comment on that, right? The the, the convergence of this is uh, is really so. So the, the, what happens on the right of this plot, right, is that uh, uh, the sort of Cisco is that the probe starts not seeing, not having enough time to resolve the cavity, and not seeing many reflections of itself, right? So of course it's not going to be exact. But one can see how universally any thermometer converges to the same asymptote. So maybe you can think of it in an asymptotic sense, right? So that's that's kind of the for any for any particular value you pick, it's not going to be exact. But asymptotically, as the acceleration goes high, right, so it, it does converge to the value that is independent on the parameters of the thermometer. I would I would formulate that. Right. I, yeah, I de I'd rather I definitely agree about that, but that's not the regime I'm interested in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair, fair I'm enough, interested in acceleration down here in the quarter. Yeah. Uh, we're just yeah. when we start to lose it. I mean, I, I definitely agree it will all converge. For very large accelerations, but I want an experiment. So I think that zero point five is still within experimental uh, uh, reach. Uh, the, that's something we can discuss. The the circular uh, case converges in the limit of large radius, exactly to just the linearly accelerating case with a small velocity offset. So I mean. Yeah. So, so I, I would argue perhaps that the convergence of this is faster, but that's something to discuss. <laughs> that's, that's uh, there's a question I think is not there's not a hand, but I think there's a question by by Rick. I'm not sure if he's still there. The yeah. Uh, actually, the the first question that I had was related to Cisco essentially and the definition of the thermometer, but I do have another one regarding the the factor of pi. So previously, you, you didn't have an explanation for this so apparently you you've found a way of, of justifying the the missing pi so i'd love to hear more about that well i wouldn't i wouldn't go as far as to say i have an explanation for the missing pi um but we have some ideas about why it's okay that it's not there um and the, the principal one in my mind is that if when we go to the experimental setup let me get it here um, okay, here's this one. The probe um, does not thermalize inside of a single cavity. Its thermalization is necessarily tied to the existence of many, many cavities, right? So if we take the L goes to infinity, the length of each cavity to get very large, uh, then you sort of spoil the effect because then in the limit, it's only in one cavity. I mean, we need to cross many of them. 
So what, what that shows is that this scenario we're talking about is not connected by a limit to the uh, canonical under effect. There's no way to take this and take a limit of it to get another one. So, uh, so it's not uh, a problem that we have these two different values for this thing because there's no there's no path connecting them where we would have to have L dependence to have a jump or something. Um, so also this is in one plus one D, uh, and we might find that some dimensional factors are missing if we did this in three plus one D. Eduardo, I know you have thoughts on this as well. Do you want to say anything? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a two two reasons here. So the, the one thing that you can check is that this setup does not go exactly as as I was saying to an infinitely long uh, cavity because this setup in the limit is a setup of cells of one cavity superimposed with another one and another, right? So in that sense, it would not go to the Andrew temperature so to the Andrew scenario when you take the L of the cavity to go to infinity. And this because this is in a cavity, it may capture geometric factors more sensitively, is basically what you said. So the, the geometric factors uh, uh, of the shape of the cavity, right, are order one factors. And it's, uh, it's thinkable that powers of pi appear in higher dimensions indeed. So it might be related to geometric factors. But again, of course, we don't have proof of that. So. But, but there's no like hand wavy argument saying, oh, we, sh we should lose a pi because of the, no. I don't know. <laughs> okay. If that's what you wanted, no, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd love to have something like this. That would be amazing. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Thanks for the, the talk, huh? All right, any more questions? If not, please, let's thank Dan again. Thank you. Great talk, let me pause the record. All right, uh, our next speaker is Barbara Soda. Uh, Barbara is a PhD student at the University of Waterloo, and she's gonna talk about the stimulated under effect, the catalyzed under effect, and acceleration-induced transparency. Very catchy title, Barbara, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, so as Eduardo already said, my name is Barbara Shoda. Um, this work was done in collaboration with Vivishak Sudhir, an experimentalist from MIT, and Achim Kemp from University of Waterloo and Perimeter. So, uh, the main topic today will be acceleration-related effects in quantum physics. Now, the issue with acceleration is that it doesn't really fit naturally into the framework of quantum physics. And therefore, we rarely deal with it, except for one prominent um, effect where we understand it, which is the UNRU effect. Now, we understand the UNRU effect, but we could ask, you know, is there more to acceleration-related effects? And should we dig deeper? I claim that we should dig deeper. And the reason is that acceleration is related to gravity through the equivalence principle. And so if we want to understand quantum effects in gravitational backgrounds, we need to understand a lot about acceleration effects in quantum physics. And so here in this talk, I will tell you about new acceleration induced phenomena. Uh, these new phenomena combined I'll show that they can lead to an increased measurability of the UNRU effect. And finally, uh, they can give us new insights into acceleration and gravity-induced effects in quantum physics. Um, so first, I'll give you an outline of the talk. Uh, we know from before, it's well known that rotating wave terms can be stimulated. People who work in quantum optics do this every day. They turn on their lasers and therefore increase the probability for absorption and emission of atoms. So that's all well known. What's new here is that I'll show that counter-rotating wave terms can be stimulated as well. Now, uh, ex experts in the audience understand what I mean by, by, this, by this terminology. And if you don't understand, don't worry, you'll understand in just a few slides. So the way um, this talk is going to go is that we'll, I'll show you how to stimulate the UNRU effect by the presence of photons in the quantum field. Then a problem will pop up, which is that 
stimulating the Unruh effect means also stimulating the rotating wave terms. And we don't want that. We just want to increase the Unruh effect signal, let's say in an experiment. We don't want uh, uh, rotating wave terms to, to pop up as well. Luckily, there's a solution to this problem. And th that's this new method um, that we came up with, acceleration-induced transparency. What it does is that it suppresses the rotating wave terms to zero. So what we are left with, left with at the end are just strong counter-rotating terms, a strong under effect. So let's dig into details of how this works. First, um, a light introduction to the standard under effect. We have our under the vid detector, uh, which is a two level system with an energy gap omega. We have our scalar quantum field with its usual free Hamiltonian. And then we have uh, the usual interaction Hamiltonian. The coupling constant G, we assume it to be small so that we can work in first order perturbation theory. And then um, the under the vid detector interacts with the quantum field along its trajectory. Uh, I, I wrote down the interaction Hamiltonian here schematically uh, in order to explain the rotating and counter-rotating wave terms that I've talked about already. So the interaction Hamiltonian looks, looks like this. The rot rotating wave terms um, are these ones. Uh, they, can either, um, they can either excite the atom while de-exciting the field, or they can de-excite the atom while exciting the field. So these terms are kind of like an exchange of a photon between uh, the atom and the field. The counter-rotating terms are a bit more interesting because they either at the same time excite both the atom and the field, or they de-excite both of them. And these are the terms, this one in particular, um, that's uh, responsible for the under effect. Uh, next thing is in the usual setup is that uh, initially initial state is um, atom in the ground state and the vacuum and the field in the vacuum state. And then we look uh, for the amplitude for this transition where the atom gets excited. We can calculate this in first order perturbation theory and we get an expression like this. Uh, here's the coupling constant G. Here's the energy scale of the photon field. And there's this interesting part the, the I plus time integral. The time integral comes from the time integration here uh, in the, uh, next to the uh, interaction Hamiltonian. So the time integral is defined like this. Uh, I also define here, here Inus uh, that I'll talk a bit more about later. And these time integrals are something like uh, Fourier transforms of the phase function that comes from the trajectory of the detector. Okay, so that's how the amplitude looks for the standard under effect. Oops. Um, the stimulated under effect has the same setup. So we have the under the detector, the scalar quantum field, and the same interaction Hamiltonian. Now the difference is that um, initial state of the field is no longer the vacuum state, but an excited state. In this case, for convenience, I chose uh, the Fox state. So this is uh, kth mod uh, uh, occupied with n photons. And so this is the initial state. And we look at look for the transition where uh, the, the detector gets excited. And we find the amplitude for this transition. OK, now, if you pay attention to just the first line of this transition, you, you'll see that the first line is like uh, the Unruh effect. Why? Because you see, at the same time, the detector got excited and also the field got excited. So that's the kind of transition that's produced by a counter-rotating wave term. And also you can see here that um, accordingly, the I plus time, oops, um, I plus time integral uh, is there as well. Now, very important, because the field didn't start in a vacuum state, but in an excited state, we get the square root of n plus one here. And this square root of n plus one is increasing the probability of the, of the transition. That's very important. 
Um, if you pay attention uh, to the second line, this line comes from, um, this part comes from the rotating wave term transition uh, because the detector got excited by the uh, field got de-excited. Uh, and it seems that it's, and it's definitely also stimulated. So that's a problem that we'll, we're going to have to deal with later. So uh, to, to co compare the two effects, um, the standard Unruh effect starts out with the atom in the ground state and the field in the vacuum, whereas in the stimulated effect, the field starts out in an excited state. The, if we compare the probabilities, uh, we see that the probability for the Unruh effect in the stimulated um, effect um, is increased by a factor of n plus one. Now, n, plus, n is the number of photons in the field. And you should start thinking that that's, that's great because the uh, number of photons in the field in an experiment can be really not a large number. So that, that's very good. But the only problem is that we are still left with this nuisance of um, rotating wave term integral, uh, which is getting into the way of uh, having a clean under effect. Um, I've just shown you uh, the result for uh, the Fox state, but I can just briefly say that uh, similar results are true for the field initially in coherent and thermal state. Uh, if the field is initially in an alpha, alpha coherent state, uh, we see that the probability is enhanced, enhanced by absolute value of alpha squared. And if you remember, um, absolute value of alpha squared is the expectation uh, value of the number operator. So again, we get an enhancement by the number of photons in the field. And similarly for the thermal state, um, the probability is again enhanced by the expected value of photon number. And uh, just in general, we can show that this is, uh, this is true for any uh, initial state. As long as the initial state of the field is not the vacuum, it's some excited state. If uh, whatever uh, the expected value of the photon number is, that's, uh, that's going to be the enhancement uh, of the, of the under effect or the transitions in general. So we come back to the problem of, we saw that um, under effect can be enhanced by uh, n plus one, but there is also this rotating wave term contribution, uh, which is getting in the way. Uh, uh, what the prominent players here are the I plus and I minus time intervals. Now we know from the standard standard under effect, we know how to eliminate I plus. So if our job was to eliminate I plus here, um, uh, we know how to do this because we know that in inertial motion, I plus is equal to zero, while I minus the rotating uh, time integral is is non-zero. Okay, but can we get, if in our problem is not that, our problem is to get rid of this one. So can we get rid of that time integral? And the answer is luckily, yes. There are trajectories where the rotating time integral I minus is zero, while the counter rotating time integral is non-zero. The acceleration can in impact counter rotating um, uh, time integral, but also the rotating wave terms. That's very important. And this is the, this is the new method that uh, I present here, the acceleration induced transparency. It allows us to get rid of the rotating wave term contribution. And we are left only with a clean and strong under effect. Uh, what I mean by a uh, strong under effect is, um, you know, lasers today, they can produce um, lots, lots of photons. So you can, they can easily produce 10 to the 20 photons per second. So uh, this can gap uh, many orders of magnitude that need to be gapped to measure the under effect. Um, and so now I'll tell you about acceleration induced transparency a little bit more, a little bit more details. Um, the simplest example where, where we see this uh, effect is uh, when the trajectory of the detector is such that moves first at a, a uniform velocity v0, then it changes its velocity to v1, 
And then finally, it moves at the velocity V2. So the question is, can we tune this trajectory so that uh, the time integral goes to zero for the detector gap omega? To answer this question, we need to do some uh, solid work. We need to actually do the time integrals. Um, the time integral splits into three parts like this. The details don't matter that much. And when we do the integral, um, the, the final expression looks like this. And it turns out that uh, for the choice of parameters, uh, this one and this one, we do get that the rotating time integral i minus is zero. So what that means is that if in an, if in an experiment, um, we choose this, this kind of a trajectory for the detector, um, the detector with the gap omega will not get excited due to the rotating wave terms. At the same I'm time, time body, okay. At the same time, the i plus time integral is not equal to zero. So if in the experiment we see that the detector got excited, it's due to the counter rotating wave terms. It's due to the Unruh effect. What it looks like um, in a plot, so we here see an absorption curve for the I minus time integral. We see two absorption peaks, which correspond to the initial and the final velocity. And in between them, there's this point where, where I minus goes exactly to zero. And if we zoom into it, we see this plot. This is the point where the I minus goes exactly to zero. While at the same time, I plotted the blue line, which is the counter rotating time integral, which corresponds to the Unruh effect, which is non-zero. What this means in an experiment is that if we, if, we, uh, if we have a lot of photons in the field, we can increase the Unruh effect uh, by a large number. So this, this effect would be huge, while this one would still remain zero. Even though we are stimulating, it's still zero. Okay, and finally, um, what's, uh, what's important, you know, is uh, in, now I showed an idealized situation where the absorption exa is exactly zero. That's not so realistic in the experiment, even, even if we manage to get absorption exactly to zero, you know, there's always some noise. But we can show for um, uh, more realistic trajectories that there are tunings of parameters where, again, we can make uh, the rotating time integral uh, small enough so that we only see most of the time we see just the Unruh effect signal. In summary, what we did, what I showed you here is that uh, we can stimulate the counter and the rotating wave term transitions. And the, when we simulate the transitions become n times stronger. Then, because we only want to see the under effect, we wanted to get rid of the rotating wave terms. And we used, I used acceleration induced transparency to suppress them. We are left with then with strong counter rotating wave terms, strong forward or time reversed under effect, which gives us a new method to measure the under effect in lab. Um, as a final uh, comment, um, you might be asking yourself, uh, when we are simulating the Unruh effect, um, uh, what, what's happening to the laser beam? What's happening to the field? Interestingly, um, most of the time, you could say, uh, if the field is in a coherent state, most of the time, nothing happens to the field. So um, what, what happens here is that, um, the field serves as a catalyst for the excitation of the detector. The detector starts out in its ground state, while the field, sta field starts out in a coherent state. Then after a while, the, the detector gets excited and the field doesn't change at all. So that's why we say, we say that it serves as a catalyst. And why did I say that this is what happens most of the time? Where to, well, to clean this, um, I need to tell you what's the probability for the catalyzed effect to happen compared to the total under effect. And then we get this complicated expression, which simplifies a lot when we use trajectories with acceleration-induced transparency. 
And then you can see here that um, if you make the number of photons very, very large, uh, this ratio goes uh, essentially to one. So we can see the most of the time, the UNRU effect is the catalyst effect when the field is in a coherent state. Okay, so uh, what I told you about today um, are, were these new effects, um, the stimulated forward and time reversed UNRU effect, the acceleration induced transparency, and the catalyzed UNRU effect. I also told you how combining them uh, leads to improved measurability of the UNRU effect, expre expressed here in this simple formula that stimulated UNRU effect is n times standard UNRU effect, where we can make n very, very large. And finally, um, what's interesting is, is that we should expect these new effects to have gravitational analog analogs. For example, that there could be set of acceleration induced transparency, some gravity induced transparency. So this could open up um, a whole new field of explorations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah. Take questions now, we see Rob. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you, quite interesting. One thing uh, I'm wondering if you'd worry about is how uh, trying to think of stable maybe is this acceleration induced transparency? Like it, it, maybe I'm wrong, but it looks to me like you had to fine tune things to get rid of the I minus. So what I might imagine would happen is that if you don't do that exactly right, then you reintroduce the I minus type term a little bit. And because it's multiplied by a factor of N, then you're effectively washing out the effect. Have you looked into that at all? Um, so, uh, so what I can say, yeah, it, of course, this is just a point at which at which uh, the you know I minus goes to zero. Uh, that's not realistic. That uh, the experimentalists would be so great that they you know get exactly the point. So they will get you know some kind of a, a, a interval around the point. But what, what would be uh, what would be most important in an experiment is that they, uh, you know, that they get close to uh, the point where I minus is um, zero or very small, so that the unru signal is, you know, ten uh, hundred thousand and who knows how many times uh, larger than the um, uh, the rotating waveform signal, and so they could say, um, you know, uh, basically almost all of the excitations that we see in the experiment are due to the UNRU effect. They could say that, you know, with some certainty. Okay, I think that needs some attention because that's one is N and the other is N plus one. So if N is large, they're basically the same, right? So a tiny yeah. little bit of I minus can do a lot of damage, but okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Yeah. Uh, I wonder if I can ask uh, quickly a, a clarifying question because uh, there's something that puzzles me uh, with this, right? Um, so, in in uh, if I go and think of the under effects uh, in general, I have an accelerate the usual, right? Accelerated detector for a long time, so it thermalizes. What we know is that the presence of any Lorentz uh, non-invariant state of the field that will actually uh, disappear eventually, right? Because what the, the detector is seeing is Lorentz boosting more and more to higher speeds. So you have a, say, a wave packet of some frequency, right? Or something, whatever state that doesn't break Lorentz invariant, that thing is gonna be blue shifted and red shifted away from the response of the detector. So we know that um, a detector interacting with an excited state of the field, uh, because in flat space time, the vacuum is the only Lorentz invariant state, it will eventually thermalize to the same Andrew temperature and have the same thermal response. But here, obviously you have a state dependence in the response. Uh, so usually in the usual way of thinking, I would say that if you have that, it's either non the under effect and it will become only the under effect when it becomes insensitive to the Lorentz invariant part. It's a, it's a vacuum effect, the under effect, like the way I see it. So I wonder uh, how is the situation different? Is it because you consider it like short times or something like that? Or, or why, is it the, why is the detector responding so strongly, as you say, where it's supposed not to, in the sense in the, in the long time limit, it's supposed not to see anything that's not Lorentz invariant? 
Okay, so I'd say that the reason why it's responding so strongly is that um, it's the same as when we are simulating the rotating wave terms. You know, you, if you want to increase the probability of some transitions, just bringing a lot of photons with the right energy, and then you will increase the probability of the transition. But that's not true for the useful Andrew effect, because in the useful Andrew effect, those photons will be blue shifted and reshifted away from the response of the detector in the long time limit, and it would, they will, the detector won't see them. Uh, oh, yes. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I assume that's because you have eternal acceleration there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, For a long time, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so here, the generically, our trajectory, the trajectory that we thought about are, uh, you know, uniform acceleration, then something interesting happened, not uniform acceleration, sorry, uniform velocity, some inertial motion, then something interesting happens, and then again, uh, you go out into infinity uh, at, uh, uniform velocity. So you don't have any uh, internal acceleration here. And the reason why we call it the Unruh effect is that it happens due to the counter rotating wave terms and the you know I, I plus uh, interval is uh, prominent there. So that, that's the connection with the Unruh effect. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you, Barbara. So sorry for, for interrupting that. Albert, I think you have a hand and Cisco. Yeah, I didn't see you, sorry about that. Uh, no so, problem. Well, actually, my well, first of all, it was a very clear talk. Uh, in fact, my question was uh, closely related to Eduardo's also remarks in the sense that it seemed to me that you were using uh, the expression Andrew effect in a loser sense, uh, meaning that, as you again repeated now, anything that comes from excitation of your detector that comes from the counter rotating terms, you call that Andrew effect. Whereas uh, what Eduardo was thinking of, and it's the sort of standard use, I would say, of Andrew effect, is that you have this kind of uh, excitation that eventually leads to a stationary regime as if you were coupled to a thermal uh, bath and gives thermalization and so on and so forth. And to have something similar to that, you need then to populate a lot, many, many, many modes, uh, you know, not just a single one as you were considering here. And also they would get, uh, you know, uh, because of this uh, redshift, you know, you need to populate many modes and some of them rather ultraviolet if you consider some time. But I think it's a matter of, uh, you're using the, the, the expression Andrew effect in a, in, a, in a loser sense, so to speak. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Exactly. Can I, can I just, I think Robman made a comment at the end that I'd like to just respond to. Uh, I think you said that, uh, you said that um, here, you know, um, you said even if I minus is not exactly zero and I plus uh, is also not zero and then I stimulate both of them, I can be in trouble. But I was, I was trying to uh, make the point that yes, I minus can also be non-zero, but it can still be much smaller than I plus. So, um, so you know, in most of the signal you'd see in the experiment would be from the counter rotating terms. That, that's what yeah. I was trying to say. Sure. I mean, I mean, the question is how much, right? Like, like many orders of magnitude would be yeah. fine, but if it's only, you know, 50% less and N is 3 billion, then, you know. No, no, you can, no, no, you can make it, uh, you know, you can make it as, as much as, you know, as uh, <laughs> depends on how much the experimentalists want to work. You can make it many, many orders of magnitude uh, larger than, uh, than the I minus. Right, so the next, again, Cisco, same as uh, with Albert. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't see the hands. My bad, uh, Cisco, please. Oh, no, no problem. Um, this question is, is related to Eduardo. Um, what he was thinking. I was wondering if there's any regime where you could uh, effectively kill the I minus, but still see some approximate notion of thermalization occurring, or if those things are mutually exclusive, um, which I think was part, part of what Eduardo was uh, kind of talking about. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if, you know, do these naturally uh, exclude each other? Or is there some possibility of seeing some effect of thermalization while uh, squashing this I minus term? Right. Okay. So this is all uh, this is all new. So this is um, uh, you know a matter okay, of okay, yeah. investigation. I, I just like to say you know uh, the Unruh effect um, uh, as we know it you know it, it includes this thermalization um, and uh, you know uh, long uh, acceleration time and so on. But this 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 new approach allows us to, to think you know beyond thermal states and uh, beyond uh, uh, you know you can at, at the same time have different modes 
um, different modes occupied. So you, you can have, you know, uh, different kinds of uh, states. So this is kind of like a generalization of what we uh, usually think of as an unreal effect. And I only use unreal effect to, uh, as, you know, kind of a connection to what we know before. But, you know, main point is that normally we, we don't see counter rotating waveforms in experiments. It's hard to see them because, you know, they are so, uh, they are so small, and in this way, we we manage to um, enhance them a lot with this uh, with this uh, procedure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank and you. So, so, so just to comment on after Albert and, and Cisco mentioned, I think it's it's interesting to to look because I, I get so to get this, of course, you need something as you said, right? Um, something not, not eternal acceleration. It'd be interesting to talk about thermality, just not because I, I get it. I mean, maybe I'm missing this. Yes, I'm not sure if you're doing that. Uh, you're talking about the fact that the detector gets excited, right, as, as the witness, but you don't yeah. analyze thermal features of it because it's mm -hmm. intu intuitively, I would have guessed, if you asked me without doing calculations, I would have guessed that uh, you will only see thermality in regimes where the state dependent part of the, the, the non Lorentz invariant part of the state of the field would not contribute. I would say this mutually exclusion that Cisco talks about is what I would have guessed intuitively. But of course, that has to be checked. So maybe it's a good idea to check if you haven't how thermal, right? The detector can become in those scenarios. Sure, sure. Yeah, new investigation. Right. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Anybody? I don't know if uh, Rick has a question or not. Uh, no, uh, I have a comment. This is a very good way to, to enhance the, the probability of getting the, the detector to be excited, right? But it, it's the, the, the matter of the thermality that everyone is talking about, which is like sort of hard to, to talk about. But uh, maybe combining uh, this sort of results with the results from, from, uh, that Dan was showing us before, maybe we could actually, uh, I don't know, get, get something more experimentally feasible out of all of these different ideas that are being presented here. So yeah, uh, thanks for the, the talk. I agree that uh, maybe combining uh, uh, combining with Daniel's talk, that would be uh, interesting. I don't agree that uh, what people are looking for is thermality because uh, to a level system, you can always describe it with the temperature. So pe what people would be happy with in the under effect is, you know, you start out with an atom in a ground state and the field in the vacuum state. And then at the end, uh, you get an excited state of the atom. That's what people would be happy about. So the excitation that you said. Uh, how we check the thermality would be. Uh, uh, I'm not entirely sure I would agree with that statement because, uh, of course, a two-level system can always be cast as a thermal state, but the temperature may not be related to the acceleration or the motion at all, right? Sure, uh, I agree. With that. Yes, yes, I, of course, I agree. With that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so anyway, thank you for the great talk, Barbara. Thanks a lot. Let's thank Barbara again. All right. So I'm gonna pause it. Right, the final speaker of the session is Benito Juarez Aubry uh, in the Departamento, I'm going to read it properly, Departamento de Gravitación y Teoría de Campos, Instituto de Ciencias Nucleares, Universidad Nacional de Autónoma de México. So Benito, uh, thank you very much uh, and the uh, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for that um, very precise, phonetically speaking, uh, introduction. Um, so, so I think um, you know, a common, a common theme, recurring theme in the theme in this me meeting has been, you know, the idea of getting closer to experiments for measuring the Unruh effect, or at least something close enough to the Unruh effect. Um, so already in Bill's talk, there was a lot of emphasis on this circular motion um, kind of um, experiment. And, and, and I think this is, you know, at the moment, this is an important question. So what I'm going to talk to you about is, um, well, my, my, my talk's called Unruh-like effects. And it's exactly this idea of going beyond linear uniformly accelerate, acceleration and thinking of other uniform trajectories um, in Minkowski space-time that could have detectors responding in some Mm, let's say generalized thermal sense, and um, so so in these couple of papers which I have written with um, first one with uh, Dimitris uh, Mostos uh, from from um, Patras University I believe in Greece, 
and um, and uh, the second one with him and also with Michael Good and a student of him, Max Temirkan in um, Astana, I believe, in, Ka in Kazakhstan. Um, so this, this couple of papers, what, what we do is, like, is a bit explore this question of, well, let's look at these other stationary trajectories and let's look at how detectors respond in these other stationary trajectories in Minkowski spacetimes. So in particular, these other stationary trajectories can be classified in terms of three parameters. And in a sense, you know, you have five non-trivial trajectories amongst which you have linearly uniformly accelerated detectors and also circularly accelerating detectors and other three that I will, I will talk about. And in, in, in a sense, one can associate in a precise sense temperatures to detectors moving along all of these trajectories. And, I, and the idea of us was to survey, um, to survey generally what happens uh, for detectors along these trajectories. So there were some results scattered around in the literature. So some people studying the circular motion already, Bill Unruh did it a while ago, maybe in the 80s, I'm not sure. Uh, some other people, well, studying perhaps something else, uh, another trajectory with another particular purpose. And, and I think here we try to collect all of these results and go beyond of what existed in the literature and really come up with some comprehensive study of stationary detectors in Minkowski spacetime and the temperatures at which they respond. So these temperatures, these unruh-like temperatures, if you will, is what what led us to call these Andrew-like effects. <clears throat> so let me start. Uh, I'll give a brief motivation and then I'll just talk about the general theory of stationary Andrew DeWitt detectors and, um, and um, in what sense temperatures can be associated um, to these stationary Andrew DeWitt detectors. So of course, the idea of associating a temperature is very clear for the linearly uniformly accelerated detector, the Andrew temperature. But the more generalized notion of temperature can be assigned to, or to these other trajectories, and I'll try to make that clear. Then I will um, go directly to, to, to discussing this Unruh-like effects along, well, in addition to the linearly uniformly accelerated detector to um, circularly accelerated detectors and so-called detectors along cusp trajectories, catenary trajectories, and helix motion. So these will be the, the five cases that I will study. And these are all the stationary motions that can, in addition to, well, of course, uh, non-accelerating that, that can occur in Minkowski spacetime. And I'll finish with some final remarks. OK, so the motivation. <clears throat> so I mean, of course, as all of you know, um, there, there is the remarkable result that um, a linearly uniformly accelerated observer in Minkowski spacetime perceives the Minkowski vacuum, well, not as empty, but rather as a thermal state. And the temperature at which um, it perceives the vacuum to be is proportional to the acceleration of the observer. So this is equation one. This is known as, as the Unruh temperature. And uh, here, um, kappa is the proper acceleration of the observer. And there is other constants decorating these, this um, acceleration. So, you know, Planck's constant, speed of light, Boltzmann constant, and so on, and 2 pi, uh, which, um, which give the, the correct units, right? <clears throat> so it is, I think, um, you know, we all agree that the Unruh effect is the most remarkable theoretical prediction of quantum field theory. And of course, I think, you know, there's an enormous credit to saying that this effect comes from applying the lessons of curved spacetime to Minkowski spacetime and uh, say the pioneers in understanding this were Fulling, Andrew Davis and undoubtedly I think that uh, these explorations were inspired by probably the, the discoveries of Hawking in regard to black holes and, and their radiation. Um, however, the, the Andrew effect, mm, well, well, it is a very nice theoretical prediction experimentally, it has been very elusive. <clears throat> so if one 
plugs in numbers in equation one uh, for an enormously high acceleration, the unroot temperature is extremely cold. So 10 to the 20 meters per second square, you get an unroot temperature that is of the order of one Kelvin. So this is extremely challenging from an experimental viewpoint and it begs us to, well, push experimental boundaries, but also think of ways in which we can perhaps design, design experiments that are um, closely related to the UNRU effect, but that we can control in a better, in a better way. So let, let's fix the ideas. And I mean, this is gonna be largely a review for many of, the, many of you, um, but let, let's make the idea precise for the UNRU effect. Um, so we can fix the ideas with an idealized probe. I'm gonna use the model, which is widely used as detectors today. It's not the only one, but I'm gonna use the, the one introduced by DeWitt in 1979, this is the Henry DeWitt detector. And the motto of particle detectors in curved space times and also in flat space time, by the way, is that a particle is what a particle detector detects. So we no longer think of particles as some, you know, excitation on Fox space or something like that, but re really as something operational. Um, so, so the Henry DeWitt detector, we, we, we think of a Okay, we're going to think of a point-like quantum system. This is obviously an idealization, um, which follows some time-like world line in space-time with proper time tau. And um, this point-like quantum system has, well, is described in a Hilbert space, which is just a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And I'm going to, and 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 we we can always span this two-dimensional space-time on a basis zero one such that these are, um, these are eigenvectors of the, of the Hamiltonian of the theory, of the, of the Hamiltonian of the detector. Um, so, so with, let's say, with a ground state with energy zero and, a, and an excited state with energy omega, if omega is positive. Of course, omega could also be negative and then the roles are reversed, okay? And this probe, we are gonna couple to a field so the simplest case is we couple it to a klein gordon field. Um, for, for the rest of the talk, this is going to be a massless uh, klein gordon field in Minkowski spacetime. Okay, that could be something more general. And we're going to couple it uh, through an interaction Hamiltonian. So the, total, um, so the total Hamiltonian of the system is going to be the Hamiltonian of the field plus the Hamiltonian of the detector plus the interaction Hamiltonian. And what form does it take this interaction Hamiltonian? Well, um, it's gonna be like in equation three here. So we are gonna couple the field to the to, to something called the monopole moment operator of, of, of the um, detector, which is, for, for now, let's just think it's, a, it's an operator that I describe at, at the bottom in blue, and it's just an operator in the Hilbert space of the detector, okay? Um, and it's gonna be coupled with a small coupling constant C, and also the interaction is gonna be controlled by a switching function, which can typically be taken as smooth and of compact support. This means that I can switch off and switch on and off smoothly the detector. So as an experimental probe coupled to the field. Okay, so now the idea is we treat the detector as an open quantum system and the Klein-Gordon field as an environment we let them interact for some time, and then at the end, we read off the detector, okay? So the total system has a density operator that evolves, of course, according to equation four, and we can make some approximations to, um, to solve this equation. In particular, we can use the Born approximation, okay? And uh, take the partial trace over the field degrees of freedom, and we have an evolution equation for the detector which is equation six. You don't need to read what's written in there in detail. It's not worth it. Just to point out that um, this is an equation where we are trying to solve for, for, the, um, um, for the density uh, matrix of the detector. And um, all the information of the, of, the field, of, the, of the field state appears in this, um, can you see my cursor? I guess you can. 
appears in this in this um, in this term here, which is the Whiteman function of the the white the Whiteman two point function of the um, of the field in the in the state where the field has been uh, prepared. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, the field dependence appears only here in that equation. Now stationarity, since we're interested in stationary detectors, it implies actually that the two-point function of the field, excuse me, I want to say that this is the pullback of the, of the Whiteman function to the detector trajectory. So you can see it only depends on two proper time points along the detector trajectory. So this is really the pullback of the Whiteman function. So stationarity implies that um, actually that this this proper time dependence comes as a difference. So I can define this function W of tau minus tau prime uh, to, be, to be the pullback of the Whiteman function along the stationary trajectory. Okay. We are interested in asymptotic states. That means uh, we want to read of the detector at late, late times. And we can further apply the Markov approximation. Um, so we disregard memory effects and so on uh, in the system. And uh, then the equation for the, um, for, the, for the detector density matrix simplifies further. Now, I want to assume something more for the, um, for the, for the state of the field. So if the state is initially in a KMS, if, if the field is initially in a KMS state, this means that it's in a finite temperature state of at finite temperature, uh, then we have that um, the Fourier transform of the of this um, the function W that I have introduced with the aid of the two point function satisfies something called the detailed balance condition, which is equation eight. And from the detailed balance balance condition, the temperature of the state appears in in this beta as as, as inverse temperature in this exponent. So this means that. Um, there, there is a word line or an operational version of the KMS condition along the for the detector. If we, if we look at excitations and de-excitation rates of the detector, and we plot them, we can we can read out this this function beta, and in this sense, the detector re records the temperature um, of the field state. Um, Need so, so, five minutes for so, Okay, thank you very much, five minutes, okay. Um, so then asymptotically, we can prove that um, in a precise scaling sense, at late times, the detector will asymptote to this state, which is, which is thermal at the temperature that the field was initially prepared in, okay. So for the UNRWA effect, everything falls in in this framework and you can compute the detailed balance temperature. Um, so let me just, uh, skip completely over the calculations which are not interesting and standard moreover and you can read off that um well that the detector will will um that the, that the um that the detector will read off the 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 only temperature proportion proportional to it to its acceleration okay so that is the under effect now what is interesting is that you can weaken the detailed balance condition and not really have a constant in this exponent, but really have a function of the frequency gap of the detector. Now, in this case, everything that leads to this final form for the asymptotic state of the detector continues to hold, with the exception that this beta is now a function of omega. So you have an asymptotic state that is also a Gibbs state, but now the temperature is frequency dependent for the, for the frequency gap of the, of the detector. So this gives a precise sense in which we can talk about asymptotic effective temperatures, even when the, the, the state of the, um, the state of the field that, 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 well, that you do not have exact detailed balance condition uh, hold along the detector world line. Okay, so, the, so actually this, this more generalized sense of detailed balance is what we will use for the other, for the other stationary trajectories in Minkowski space. So they can be parameterized by three parameters, the proper acceleration of the trajectory, something called the torsion, which says how the trajectory curves 
it twists around, and hypertorsion, which, well, is perhaps a little bit more intricate to describe uh, geometrically in an intuitive way. Um, but, you know, curves that have hypertorsion are really curves that kind of move in three, three dimensional space rather than just some projection to one dimension like uni linearly uniformly accelerated or two dimensions like circular motion. Okay, so non-trivial stationary trajectories are the linear, the cusp, the circular, the catenary, and the helix. And the, the point is to study the effective temperatures in each case. Well, we're gonna do it by a combination of analytics and numerics. So the first one is the cusp, cusp motion. So this is really a motion that, as you can see from equation 13, takes place on the XY plane. So it's a two dimensional motion in, in space. And it's really called cusp motion because it does, the projection to two dimensions really does form, form a cusp at the origin, as you can see from, from these two components of the, of the um, word line uh, parametrization. And in fact, in this case, you can obtain the, the temperature in an analytic way. It looks a little bit complicated, complicated and it, it is indeed frequency dependent. And you can see that depending on the frequency, you can get to colder or hotter temperatures with respect to the Umbra effect. So this is a plot, say for positive omega. So you can say, so you can see here at one is the Umbra temperature and you can dip under or you can get, um, above the, the urinary temperature when, um, when the frequency gap becomes very large. Okay, for circular motion, um, well, now you have um, motion that depends on the angular velocity, the radius and the velocity of the detector. This can all be parameterized in terms of um, non-zero um, acceleration and uh, non-zero torsion. It's called ultra tor because it has the condition that torsion is always greater than acceleration in absolute value and zero hypertorsion, okay? So analytic expressions are intractable, but in fact, you can prove that in the limit when acceleration goes to zero, this, the temperature of the circular motion goes to zero. And in the limit when, um, when the, um, the torsion goes to the acceleration, then this coincides with the cusp uh, motion temperature. So these, um, so, so this you have to you have to show them by using those detailed valence formula and, and probably uh, you have to use um, also some some convergence arguments. So we use um, dominated convergence in, in those cases. Okay, so there are some interpretations for these um, for these um, um, limits. So kappa goes to zero is a low speed speed limit, while b goes to kappa is um, in a sense a high speed limit. So in fact, um, indeed in the rest frame, this looks like velocity is going to one and the uh, radius is becoming very large and um, angular velocity going to zero. So a way to interpret this and why it coincides with the cusp temperature is suppose you don't take the limits right away, but before you perform a Lorentz transformation to another frame, which, I, which, I, which is essentially a translation in the X direction and a boost in the TY plane, then one has these transformations and then in the limit, you can get, you can see that this coincides with the cusp trajectory. So first Lorentz transform and then take the limit because otherwise this doesn't make, make much sense. So this, is in, so this is the reason why these temperatures coincide in this limit. Okay, so some plots um, just so that you see um, the regimes that we cannot control analytically and how at large velocities this approximates indeed the the cusp temperature that we can control. Now for the cat, now the next one is the catenary motion. In this case, curvature is larger in absolute value than torsion and hypertorsion is equal to zero. Um, well, again, uh, the projection to two dimensions looks like a catenary. This, this is why it's called catenary motion. And um, again, we have some low speed limits. B goes to zero for the catenary coincides with the under effect. And in the high speed limit, B goes to, uh, so torsion goes to acceleration, coincides again with the temperature of the cusp. Again, we can interpret this in terms of these limits, Lorentz transformations in singular limits. And here I show you again some plots so that you can see the limits 
um, for for the under effect and thrust motion at um, in the, in, the, in these relevant limits, and also to to see the intermediate kind of um, behavior for the catenary. Finally, the helix is really an honest three-dimensional uh, motion in in space. It really does look like a helix, indeed. And so a circular motion with a certain drag. And this one is uh, it's a little bit more complicated to um, to parameterize. Let me not go into the details because I don't have much time. But you know, you have you have the reference to the papers if you want to have a look. And uh, indeed, we have uh, three limits. So when um, torsion is smaller than curvature in absolute value, um, you, you tend to the catenary, in fact. When they are equal, torsion and curvature, and you go hyper, hyper torsion to zero, you tend to the cusp. And in the case of um, torsion greater than, than curvature in absolute value or acceleration in absolute value, um, then in the limit uh, of vanishing hypertorsion, you get to the circular motion. You can interpret them in terms of Lorentz transformations as before. And here's a plot just in the case where um, acceleration or curvature is equal to torsion and with um, for different uh, energy gaps of the detector. So just simpler to present this in this particular case, which is two dimensional. Okay, a summary of limits is in the following sense. From the helix, you can get to the circular, the cusp or the cat, catenary. In, a, in appropriate limits from the catenary, you get, get can get to the unru temperature and then to zero when with vanishing acceleration. From the circular, you can only get to zero because in fact, um, so remember that um, you cannot take B to zero without taking kappa to zero in the circular because uh, B has to be greater than kappa in absolute value. And from the cusp, you can also get to temperature zero. So final remarks, I mean, we've studied by numeric and analytic techniques, UNRU-like temperatures along different stationary trajectories in Minkowski space times. We have attempted to make a rather complete work on the topic. Previously, there were some partial results scattered around in the literature. And for, for example, the helix motion had not at all been ex explored analytically because it's kind of hard. So numerical evidence suggests that large omega is well experimentally attractive. However, for the UNRU effect, we know that large omega, so for the you know, honest linear uniformly accelerated motion, we know that large omega also means that you need longer times for thermalization. And of course, circular and perhaps helix motions are experimentally attractive for tabletop experiments. And this is the references perhaps that bitten on my question time, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Benito. Thank Benito. Very interesting talk. Uh, any questions? I don't see any hands yet. I have a question, but I'm going to wait a little bit. I don't want to jump uh, in front of the queue as I did before. <laughs> OK. Uh, nobody? Okay, well, I'll ask my question then. Uh, uh, so, so very interesting, uh, Benito, very systematic study. Um, I wonder, uh, are there regimes within the more exotic trajectories mm -hmm. where you could get uh, less dependence on omega, right? I mean, those regimes in which you can have a wider range of thermal response that is universal in a way outside of the accelerating case, because those are, that, they would be interesting to me, right? Those in which detectors thermalize regardless of what thermometer you put in, right? They would thermalize. Uh, and thermalizing a different, in a different, in a, uh, to a different temperature, right? Uh, I guess a temperature that depends on the parameters of the motion, but not strongly, let's say, of the gap of the detector. Do you how you find how you found regimes like that, or are you interested in those? Regimes? So, so you're thinking in terms of in terms of omega? Yes, only. Okay. I mean, but basically, this this idea of I want as possible that uh, the temperature is detected by any thermometer that I accelerate. Of course, it will depend on the parameters of the motion. But I wonder uh, if you can find regimes where it doesn't depend on the gap. Yeah. Mm. Just because that would mean that no matter what thermometer you put in, it would thermalize to that temperature. Whereas if it depends on the gap, the temperature does depend on the, what thermometer you put in. Right? If it's hydrogen <laughs> or rubidium or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's tricky because these temperatures are strongly depending on omega in right. general. Um, so. To me, a priori, I don't see. 
I mean, of okay. course, in the, when omega tends to infinity, I would expect everything to, but perhaps that's not so. Yeah. That's not so interesting. Uh, 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 probably it has to be around the constant acceleration, right? So I'm thinking more like perturbations of the constant accelerated trajectory that somehow yeah. amplify the temperature, but don't introduce a strong dependence on omega. So the, if it's more strongly dependent on the parameters of the motion, let's say, then it is an omega, kind of that kind of period. Yeah, that, that, does, that does sound reasonable, actually. If you would be very close to, but, but then if you're very close to, you know, constant temperature, which is the owner effect, mm -hmm. then this has other drawbacks experimentally. Right. No, but there's something maybe we can keep talking about because I think it could be interesting. There could be interesting studies of regimes in which you depart from Andrew in ways yeah. that you can increase the temperature and still get some universality in the response of thermometers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's a question, uh, Rob, sorry. I mean, I don't know when you raise your hand. That's... Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so again, I, I mean, uh, something that comes to mind in this, this is all flat space, right? Yeah. Yeah, so an obvious thing to consider are the analogs of this in curved space. So presumably, uh, like an ADS, there's this threshold temperature to see the effect. So presumably, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you you have to you have to be able to. I mean, ADS is probably a good example because I think in ADS you can you can still talk about stationary trajectories. Actually, I think the sitter is also very attractive for this. Yeah, well, those are the two obvious examples that that come to mind, and I think it might be worth yeah. uh, thinking about what happens to all this in that context. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Yorma and. Um, I think you even mentioned it in your talk. I mean, Yorma and Lee have studied, for example, circular motion in black holes. Yeah, BTZ. Uh, in BTZ, yeah. yeah. So, so you can definitely go beyond, you know, these maximally symmetric examples, but you definitely have to have enough symmetry to be able to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Well, the things to try are, are ADS, DS, probably BTZ to begin with. Yeah, yeah, That's for sure. Enough. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank Rob. You. Any other questions? I have another, but uh, again, <laughs> kind of provoking people. <laughs> okay, so so my other question is uh, about the Born approximation yeah. that you use. Oof. I mean, uh, I I know I know that uh, for example the the um, yeah if you can go to it that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So uh, I know that the, the order, if, if I were to do a perturbative study, the order in perturbation theory at which uh, the field of the detector gets entangled, it's, uh, it's the same order as the response of the detector when the detector is ground. So mm -hmm. I, I, I wonder, I, I would, a priori, I would have said, uh, how is the approximation justified? I know that you say small coupling, right? But if I were to go perturbative, I do know, you say that the, in, in the end is, so it's equation five, I guess. How does equation five fit in this? Because again, the detector and the field get entangled at the same order as C square, right? So I, I wonder exactly in what sense this approximation gives you that and is good or is good or, or works. That's a very good question. I mean, the, the answer is I don't know where it breaks down the Born approximation. I think it's it still may not matter for what you look because you're looking kind of at the local noise term of the detector, right? You're looking at the excitation. Um, that may still not matter, but it definitely makes me more, more skeptical mm -hmm. because I know, so if I try to reconcile with things that I know, which is, oh yeah, detector and field get entangled and lead in order at the same way as the detector gets excited. And some approximation that you say, it's a product state, right? And it's small c, yep. but make me wonder yes. how is that compatible, right? That's the, yes. I think it may be fine because again, you're looking at the response of the detector. It may be fine, but I'm not sure. <laughs> That's my point. I'm not sure if yeah. you're killing also other terms. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not totally sure. Um, I'm, I'm not so familiar with what you're saying first about entanglement being mm -hmm. of the same order, mm -hmm. I guess. Right. Um, it is. It comes to the U2. So, so if you do a perturbative expansion, you get the probability, uh, the response to the probability, which is U1, U1, U1 squared, U1 comes from the first order square. Those so are the diagonal mm -hmm. terms of the detector. But mm -hmm. the, the, the non-diagonal terms that mix detector and field yeah. come at U2, right? At U2, you're excited and correlatedly detector and field. Mm -hmm. 
uh, mm -hmm. they and, and that is entanglement inducing that mixes the detector um, uh, uh, that with the field right that's, that's the point but then again um, yeah uh, if you start from an initial state like the ground state you're fine right because uh, again you want the local terms and a leading order you get that the detector will evolve to a diagonal density matrix so I guess it depends on the initial state you pick on what you look at right mm. well Maybe maybe you can tell me more about that in okay. you know some other time because I don't know I don't know if Dimitris wants to wants to say something about this he's I think he's around <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just uh, you know get him in into the fight no no it's just it's just a way of saying no okay. let me just say I mean I think these kind of approximations are just used uh, widely. Yeah, yeah. Are just used widely for this for this unruly width detectors, and perhaps we, you know, perhaps we should think about it more carefully, mm -hmm. or more thoroughly, or justify it more rigorously. At this point, I, we we we've said, well, let's use the Bowen approximation because this allows us to, and it and it is widely, you know, used. So in a sense, it's a part of the folklore of these yeah. unruly width detectors, but. Definitely I have no doubt this... that the, the results are correct. So that's what I mean. It's more like trying to reconcile this approximation with yeah. uh, the fact that detectors until do get entangled at the in order. Yes. No, I would. I would certainly like to think about that more. Yeah. So Dimitris has. Uh, you have your your hand up. You can talk. Uh, you kind of mute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, I agree with all this entanglement and the Bonac approximation, but it's a very standard approximation in quantum optics open system. If you want to solve the system, otherwise I don't know if you can uh, solve your differential equations. And yeah, I don't find a problem with this approximation. You will get, you will get the standard results at the end. It's a very standard approximation. At the least uh, working with Unruh-Devitt detectors, we know that uh, this approximation works. I think there might be assumptions on the initial state of the detector and the field. So basically mm -hmm. what you want is in the end to end up with a non-mixed detector density matrix, because if it's mixed, if you start pure and it's mixed later on, there's entanglement with the field that happens a second order. So I, I think that assuming maybe that the detector starts in the ground state, you're fine. This is my, my intuition. Oh, from okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I agree that maybe this is not the best approximation, uh, but I feel that this approximation works well, at least uh, at the regimes we are working right. on. Uh, yeah, and eventually uh, the results are there and uh, robust. All right. Thank you, Dimitris. Th thank you, Benito. Uh, uh, I think if there are no more questions, let's thank Benito again. Really good talk. Enjoyed it. And also, let's thank all the speakers of the session. Rob already left, but we can thank him in, uh, for, you know, on behalf of everybody. <laughs> and uh, with this, we end the session. Remember that uh, we will uh, meet again. Okay, bye bye, done. Uh, we will meet again uh, next week on Wednesday, the same time. And uh, remember also that uh, this session will be recorded uh, after proper editing. Will be recorded. Uh, will be uh, posted on the YouTube channel. Yeah, thank you very much to all speakers. Thank you very much uh, to everybody and uh, see you next week.